Good evening all and welcome. The armed forces certainly have a hell of a lot to deal with, as we're about to find out in tonight's video. So join me, but don't forget to check out our app, Mort's Bedtime Stories, link at the top of the description, and while not follow me on Twitter and Instagram for good measure. See you there. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My dad was in the Navy for 20 years, and I was alive for the last 13 of those years. Normally, military families, at least in the US, travel around a lot, and it's not unusual for a family to be uprooted every two to three years. I was lucky that after my parents got married, my dad was stationed in Virginia in 1993, where both my younger sister and I were born she two years after me. Shortly after my sister's birth, in 1996, we moved to North Florida and have been there ever since. We even lived in the same base house for about a decade until my dad retired. Needless to say, we grew up, used to be friends coming and going depending on their parents' duty station, while we oddly didn't go anywhere. The way the base was set up, was that two houses were connected and went 123 street name A, 123 street name B. The house my family lived on was B, and in the early 2000s, a family of four moved into A. I was in kindergarten and first grade at the time, so I was at that age where I don't quite understand the idea of divorce and remarriage. The family that moved next door was a blended family in several ways. The husband was black, the wife was white, the daughter's slash stepdaughter was white, and the three-year-old was mixed. I remember this was super confusing for me because I didn't quite understand how the daughter was white, not realizing she had a different father. He had a brother in the area, so his niece would come over, and she was over so often I thought she lived there, which only added to my confusion. Anyway. Apparently, they weren't very good neighbors. They'd have house parties at all hours and pound on the walls, which my mom reported to housing. She told me and my sister to never go to their house, and at the time, I had no idea why. I did, however, go into the house once, and for some reason, it stuck in my memory. I had been playing a weird kind of catch with the two-year-old who wasn't allowed outside, and I wasn't allowed inside. So we stood in the doorway and I stood in their covered driveway throwing the ball back and forth. Eventually the ball went somewhere the two-year-old wasn't able to reach, so I went inside to retrieve the ball, justifying it that I'd only be a few minutes if that. The way the house was set up was that the door at the side of the house led directly into the kitchen, which was separated from the living room by a half wall to the left. I remember going in and looking in the living room and it just being a complete mess. I couldn't believe how dirty it was. Then out of the blue, the family moved. Usually there was some form of warning when a family left, but with this one, there wasn't. I eventually forgot about them and for the most part continued on with my life. Well, fast forward to 2006 or seven and I am in around sixth grade when I noticed the niece at my middle school, but she doesn't remember me. Fast forward again to September of 2008. It's orientation for my freshman year of high school, and she's in one of my classes, so our parents end up meeting and talking. That weekend, my mum sits me down and finally explains what happened. Apparently, the husband had gotten into trouble with housing, so his family was kicked out. Well, that left the place an absolute pigsty, unsurprisingly. The policy for that is the housing office sends a cleaning crew in and it comes out of the person's paycheck. Well, a cleaning lady reached up to see if anything was left on the shelf in the master bedroom closet and found something. When she looked at the pictures, they were of girls in my neighborhood and were incredibly inappropriate. Keep in mind these girls ranged in ages 5 to 10. Immediately, the base's police were called and he was arrested. 
NCIS ended up investigating it, and because my house was connected to theirs, my dad was interviewed about what he knew. He was shown the pictures and asked to identify the girls, and if my sister and I had gone into the house. My mum told me that my dad told her that the pictures were the most depraved things he'd ever seen, and they were burnt into his memory for the rest of his life. It turned out all of my friends were his victims, including his own stepdaughter, and that he had been bribing them with toys and candy. My family and another one were the only two spared because my mum didn't allow me or my sister into the house, and the other family's daughter didn't fit into his age range. My mum explained that she had gotten an uneasy feeling from him and couldn't quite explain why. She even said she tried ignoring it, because he was in the Navy. It ended up that the couple got a divorce. The husband went to military prison, though he's since been released, and the wife moved back to Canada with her daughter and left her son with her former brother-in-law to raise. Since the Second World War, many of my family members have served in the armed forces. This story in particular was passed down by my granddad, whose uncle served in the Western Desert due to the mass retreat in Tobruk. His name, William Meeking. He was a bombardier in the Royal Artillery, which is the British version of a full corporal. So Bill and a few others, including a number of Royal Engineers sappers, were digging holes to place mines to slow down the German advance during World War II. When tragedy struck, a young officer was killed by a German shell. So the body was pulled into the shade and loaded onto a truck back to town. After many mines had been buried and some hours later, a British truck, a Bedford OY, from one of the stragglers slowing the Germans' advance, hurried up to the minefield. One of the boys said, Here, Bill, look at this poor sod. The route isn't even drawn yet. They could clearly see wounded men in the rear of the vehicle and driver and co-driver talking to themselves out of the cab window. Then Bedford revs the engine and drives into the minefield. Here, what are you doing? One of them shouted. No idea, replied Bill, but clearly he has a death wish. They tried to get the driver's attention as they watched this line truck weave backwards and forwards, left and right, until it reached safety and parked next to their truck. Bill and the others rushed up to the truck and shouted, What are you doing? You could have been killed. The driver replied, It was fine. A young officer with blonde hair came to the side and said to follow him across the minefield. As long as we'd followed him, we'd make it across. What was his rank? One spot Rupert, why? As Rupert is a nickname for lower ranked officers. Did he have blonde hair? Yeah, that's him, replied the driver. Bill stood aside and viewed the body with the driver. Can't be, explained Bill. He was killed eight hours ago. The driver said, but that's him there. You're saying his ghost saved us? Brave fellow. Great Uncle Bill died in 1983, just one month shy from before I was born. My husband Ted is in the military. We have generally lived on bases every station that we've been to because the surrounding towns can be very crime ridden and sketchy. And with my husband gone most of the time, the extra security is appreciated. I work from home due to us moving so often, so one afternoon I was taking a break. Had me a bite to eat and was slugging up on the couch with my dog. That's when I heard the sliding glass door open. It was so nonchalant, I thought it was Ted. I saw my cat run from the kitchen and a shadow standing near the door entering it. I thought maybe he had come back for something, so I called out for him and was like, what are you doing home? Did you forget something? But there was no answer. This is where I just got an eerie feeling. After I asked what he was doing here, I saw the shadow move and heard the click from the sliding door lock. From there, he walked to the laundry room and shut the door. I still had received no response, 
So I'm sitting on the couch, scared out of my mind, and I call my husband, hoping to hear his phone in the laundry room. I don't hear a ring, but he answers. I asked him why he came home, and he didn't answer me, and all he says was, that wasn't me. Grab the dog and get into the car. After getting off the phone with Ted, I grab the dog and run to my car, and from there I call the military police. Waiting for them was probably the longest 20 minutes of my life. When they get there, they cleared the house and found no one. They asked me to make a statement, and they were baffled how someone would try it on this base. We still live here, and honestly, I'm scared he would come back. The first time I ever experienced something was during marine combat training at Camp Lejeune. They always said this one area of the woods was haunted, and I was always like, yeah, right. So me and this one other dude had to take out the trash late one night, and he's too scared to walk in the woods, so I do it. As I'm tossing the bags over, I distinctly hear footsteps in a puddle right behind me. I figured it was the other dude, but no one was there when I turned around, and it was a sizable clearing, and there were no animals around either. I asked the guy about it, but he basically said piss off and ran. Another time, when I was in Oki, everyone in my unit was convinced our barracks were haunted by some old guys from World War II. On a side note, superstition is taken very seriously by the locals there, and they've been known to halt construction on buildings and not post men because of ghosts. Anyway, I wake up one night to a slight earthquake, which is normal, but I notice that none of my model gunmen are rocking like they usually do, especially when the room feels like it's rocking that hard. I said screw it and try to get back to sleep. I start feeling footsteps on my bed like a cat walking across it. And now I'm pretty scared. Because so many people in my shop have personal ghost stories and I had no explanation for this one. I decide that if it's a demon or something I need to see it. So I counted to three and opened my eyes. And was met with nothing being there. Just to give some context, I'm a marine. And since being in the military, I have seen some weird stuff. We all have, even the instructors at the School of Infantry. In boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina, it was around 2 a.m. I went on fire watch and saw an orb go into the roof of the building. But that was not the only thing. Months later, as I left the island, I went to North Carolina to the School of Infantry, or ITB, Infantry Training Battalion. We were on the grenade range, and our combat instructor told us he would see some weird stuff, but we kind of brushed it off considering we did a 10k hike to the grenade range and we just wanted to sleep. Later that night, a few guys on Firewatch freaked out because they saw a little girl running into the woods and kept coming to the perimeter. Said she had a white dress on. I never got to see it, but six people told me. Later on, at the end of it, it was our last range, and we got in trouble, and I forgot why, but he made the whole squad get on fire watch instead of just two people, and it was pouring down raining. So I had to take a piss, so I jogged across the street. It's like midnight, so I go to take a piss and hear a loud sounding scream. I froze to see if I could hear anything, and then my head moved and the scream got louder, so I took off running and ran towards my buddies. And I said, you hear that stuff? And he said, yeah, that scream, right? Chills went right down my spine. Safe to say, it was a very rough night. This happened at Muscatatuck Urban Training Center in 2013. We were medical support for a big exercise going on there. My buddy and I were already on night, so we stayed alone in the old hospital building to watch the SI slash clinic stuff the night before the exercise kicked off. We were the only soldiers on the installation aside from maybe the fire slash emergency service guys, if they even stayed there overnight. Everything in the hospital building was intact from when it was abandoned, rocking chairs, medical tables, etc. It was like a ghost town. 
That night, we swore we heard someone talking in the basement as we were on the first floor and went to check it out, but there was nothing, no one. Not long after, the power goes out and we ran out of the building to wait outside. After it came back on, we went to turn on some extra lights and one of the bulbs exploded and scared the hell out of us. I don't know if there was a phantom right there with us. When I was young, I was deployed to Ambar Province, Iraq. For those of you who haven't seen IDF shelters downrange, they're not much to look at, but you have to understand what they look like for this story to make sense. They're nothing special, just some concrete upside down U-shaped things that sometimes have sandbags all around them. They have ingress slash egress routes on both sides of them. Through the course of my deployment, I had noticed very briefly shadowy figures moving quickly into them, and it always kind of startled me. And often I would check the shelters to see who ran into them, just to see who it was. To my surprise, the first few times there was nothing in there, with the exception of a few packs of water bottles, some occasional trash and dust. I kept it to myself, because I thought I could have just been seeing things, and I might have been off my rocker. Later on the deployment, I was hanging around some HESCO barriers with a buddy just messing around, when he turns to me after a brief moment of silence and says, Hey dude, have you been seeing silhouettes running super quickly into the IDF shelters, or am I losing my mind? Naturally, I told him about my sightings of the figures, and we were both kind of creeped out for a bit. Over the course of the deployment, we had discovered that a total of 16 people in our company had seen these figures, including ones who'd been to this camp three times before and told us he had seen them every time he'd been there. I don't believe in ghosts, but it definitely freaked me out. Afghanistan, 2018, Mortars. It's the second rotation to this operation. Each operation has one mortar section attached to it, and they rotate out to give each other some rest. Benny is manning the 240 blocking position next to their mud hut. Directly to the left is the mouth of the valley, and to the right is nothing but mountains and Pakistan, into which he may or may not have accidentally sent some HE rounds on a fire mission. The 240 position is facing a large hill that they run to for personal training to try and avoid getting fat, as all they do is eat four MREs a day. To the right of that hill, is about two kilometers to another operation, the only other one in the valley. Now, on to the story. There had just been some gale force winds absolutely messing up everything. Mud huts, shacks, all falling over, getting obliterated. Benny's from Florida, and thought he was experiencing a hurricane. After it finally stops, an incredibly dense fog slowly rolls in and encompasses the entire valley like a blanket. He showed me a video of it, and it's eerie to watch. Just a methodical fog, creeping and swallowing everything until it reaches the edge of the operation. After sunset, the fog becomes impenetrable. Benny can't see beyond the barrel of his 240, not even thermals could cut through it, it's that thick. All they have to operate on is sound, and they're scared of lighting up friendlies. Fast forward a bit, and for three days now they've been dealing with this fog. All three days they've been picking up ICOMs in the hut the SF dudes are occupying. Unencrypted ISIS chatter from the interpreter and translating, all basically saying, we're going to hit them tonight in the fog, they can't see anything. As an aside, they would pick up the intercoms whenever they ran a fire mission. They would graffiti on the walls of the mortar huts, hilarious things they'd hear, including but not limiting to, everything's exploding, and why are they shooting at us? So needless to say, everyone is on edge in this fog because they can't see anything, 
ISIS are talking about overrunning something and they're hearing things in the fog at night, but nothing ever happens. There's an operation in the valley, but there's also Afghan command and local AMP presence scattered around the valley. ISIS could be talking about any location. So Benny readies for an attack at all times whenever the fog starts encroaching. They haven't been running fire missions since the fog began because no one could call for fire when the visibility is so low and all the mortars are pulling guard. The sun sets, the fog rolls in. It's tranquil for a while, but tense. Then suddenly, GBs start hauling ass out of their hut and jump onto their roofs. It has the best vantage point of the valley, so they co-locate up there with Benny's FDC and call adjustments. Yo, they shout down at the mortars. Fire mission, let's go. Oh crap, it's happening. Everyone is scrambling on the radio and the Afghan commandos are begging for help. Please, we need everything you have right now. Please, oh God, help us. And he thinks to himself, they're getting really messed up. The commandos were given the exact grid. Everything you have right now, here. Cool, we got a grid. But Benny and the mortars are still unsure. What does everything mean? So after a quick 20 minutes of deliberation, they decide, screw it. ISIS has been talking about making a move. They're finally doing it. So let's give them 20 rounds. Why? pose an immediate suppression. A gunner for whom Benny has immense respect is on gun, so he knows these rounds are going to be right on target. They throw the rounds downrange and wait for the radio. Again, again, hit it again, same spot, then more please. What the hell, Benny's thinking? Must be a huge movement, screw it, send it. 40 more rounds of white foss and the same data. They rain hell and steel upon this one spot. They're standing in the operation, and despite this thick fog, they can see the silhouette of a hillside five kilometers in the distance illuminating against the backdrop of constant woolly peat rounds impacting. It's completely ablaze. After some minutes, they finally hear cheering over the radio in the distance. They can actually hear the AKs clacking off in celebration. Benny and the mortars are fist bumping and patting each other on the back. The AMP gets on the radio and the interpreter translates his message. Thank you, you did a great job. We got her. What? They ask for clarification. Say again, her? What do you mean her? The interpreter listens and the AMP commander explains before turning to them and explaining. There's a witch living on the mountain. For decades she's controlled the weather. She summons the strong winds, and a few days ago, she was the one that brought in the fog. What in the damn hell? We just dropped 60 rounds of white foss on this old lady's mountain home. The next day, the fog receded and never came back the rest of the time we were there. Benny's been lobbying to get some sort of official recognition as witch hunter ever since. Unfortunately, he got ets last month, so he lost the good fight. In 2017, I was in a bit of a rough place. A project booth that my friend and I both worked on had fallen flat on its face, which led to a lot of stress for both of us and many slanderous accusations that drained us mentally. Not only that, I was also going through a nasty and vile breakup from my emotionally abusive ex. When I got a phone call out of the blue from my bestie, we refer to each other as brother and sister, which confuses people as she's a northern lass. She had just signed paperwork to secure one of the last few World War I warships from scrap. The vessel in question was once known as HMS Saxifrage, built in 1917 and launched in early 1918 as a Q-ship. She was built to look like a cargo ship to lure German U-boats. Then, when surfaced, would either fire or ram at high speed to sink them. In 1922, she was renamed HMS President and became a training ship for the Royal Navy Reserve until demobbed. Fast forward a few years and we enter the commercial dockyard to see a very sad and forlorn looking ship with what looks like a shed on top and covered in pigeon poo. From day one, we were introduced to her ghostly crew. 
Day and night you'd hear footsteps, talking, and strange mechanical noises. One afternoon, I was searching on B-deck for an extension lead. Each cabin was full of an old office and looked eerie like the staff just got up and left. Anyway, I found a lead right under a row of desks, so using my combat skills, I did a combat crawl under them. Just as I got to the lead, I heard footsteps on the wooden floor. I thought perhaps my bestie was coming down to check on me, so I shouted, Hey sis, I found one. No response. Lisa? No reply. Then I saw a pair of old World War II style naval bell bottoms walk past the door. I just about crapped myself and jumped up in a panic, forgot I was under the desk until I saw stars when I knocked three colours of crap out of myself. I rushed up the stairs and the deck and ran straight to the office, gibbering to Lisa. The response I got from her made sure we didn't stay late that night. On another occasion, we were on B-deck again, working away clearing one of the rooms, when we both heard very loud and pronounced footsteps. It was so loud that you could make out the strides and continual thuds. We stopped and looked at each other. We're alone up here, aren't we? Lisa replied with, must be a pigeon. I looked at her and said, what, a pigeon with hobnob boots? Then one night I had a phone call from security and had to check the ship after work. I got on the vessel around 10pm and found a leak from rainwater. So off I went with torch in hand as hardly any lights worked and found a mop and a bucket. It was laborious work, so I took my phone out and started to play music. There was an odd sensation that I wasn't alone. Each ten minutes I kept stopping and looking around in the darkness. I decided to concentrate on the job at hand, singing badly to the songs when Ramstein came on. I heard a thud, so I stopped and looked, thinking, that's odd. I started getting into the song, Sonny, a bit more, that's odd, oh well. I started getting into the song, Sonny, a bit more, when I heard, oi, that was odd but I ignored it. This time I heard it closer. Oi, you! Closer still. While still playing Ramstein, I heard someone approach the doorway next to me and shout, Turn that crowd crap off. In a blind panic, I climbed up the emergency crew ladder and left the ship with all the lights on. The worst night I had is when I stayed overnight with my sis. I had turned the telly off and climbed back into bed. The dock had let water out to cater for low tide, and the ship coming in blocked the natural moonlight out the porthole window in the room. It must have been around 3am, and I was aware of movement in the room. In a semi-awake state, I could make out a shadow standing in the doorway about 5 foot 2 with a big coat on. My first thought was, intruder. It was nothing unusual, as we used to get urban explorers break in when empty. I adjusted my eyes and saw it looked like a woman. Lisa? I went to ask her why she was there when I found out I couldn't speak nor move. I tried as hard as possible to move but couldn't. I tried to shout for help and scream at the shadow, but all that came out was sounds. It sounded like I'd suffered a stroke. I was dribbling and panic kicked in. Was I having a stroke? Was I having a seizure? Why couldn't I move? Then out of the blue I managed to spasm in my leg and booted the wall. I screamed in pain which woke up Lisa. Needless to say, we didn't sleep any more that night. We still worked on the ship and hoped to safeguard her for future generations. We looked into the naval reserve and over the years many men went to war who trained there and never returned. Even after the war, some of her reservists died in service to the crown. Some of these men died on the ill-fated Karatoa, who was sunk by the Queen Mary. Maybe these people had come back to stay with the ship they had originally enjoyed serving on. This happened in Sadar City, early 2008 in the middle of the night. We were providing security for the install Alaska barriers along the road. We were in our ASVs, probably 10 meters from four away. I'm just chatting with my driver and gunner when I see a soldier at the near right corner of that intersection. I'm pissed 
Who's this jackass in my sector without calling ahead? He looks back into my direction, then steps off towards the opposite corner of the intersection. Since he had the best night vision, I say, Gunner, can you tell me who that is? By this point, the dude is still walking and right in the middle of the intersection when he starts fading away. He was about five feet away from the corner, and by that time he'd vanished completely. He was tall, six foot one or so, thin, mid to late twenties, ACUs with a green beanie, no body armor, and an M16 slung around his back. The driver didn't really see anything, and the gunner wasn't sure what it was. That was 14 years ago, and I can still see that kid plain as day. I was at a NATO conference in Prague, and we were staying at a large hotel that was originally built for the Communist Party higher-ups. The OIC of our group made us do personal training in the morning, so we get back to our rooms at around 7.30am to shower and get ready for the day. The whole hotel was usually empty the whole morning when we get back there. One morning at the far end of the hallway, I saw a really old dude in a sharp black suit and tie with a top hat and monocle. He looked at me, I looked at him. He walked around the corner and vanished. He wasn't there when I checked where he went. That seriously spooked me. Iraq 2005. It was night time and we were pulling security on a rooftop. I'm standing there looking over the city skyline, and up in the sky I saw what looked like a meteor or trace around. Halfway through its flight path, all of a sudden it made a 90 degree turn and accelerated impossibly fast through a series of hard turns before vanishing completely. Before I can say anything, the guy next to me goes, holy crap, did you see that? Another thing that was spooky but more explainable is the premonitions of danger people have. Sometimes you know you're about to get attacked, and you don't know how or why, but you just do. This story happened at Fort Campbell, where there's an area that nuclear material is transported by train, and you can walk the perimeter of that area on a dirt path, where the guards were told to shoot anyone on sight if they were trying to access the nuclear area way back when. Also in that area, there are Nazi graveyards where prisoners of war were buried after World War II. SWAT stickers on the tombstones and everything. SFC Spooky Stories tells my WLC squad while we're out there that a soldier snuck over the perimeter in the 80s to see the gravesite and got shot by the guards. And one of those guards was so upset at having killed another soldier that he took his own life and that that soldier still haunts the trail seeking to fulfill his duties. And if you cross the trail at the same place and time of the offended soldier, he will shoot you. So we ha 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 and of course went back down there after WLC to see it through. So three high-speed NCOs were down there at midnight to cross the trail and get shot at by the ghost soldier. Also graveyards at night are dope. We cross the trail and nothing happens. We go look around the cemetery nearby, mess with the pennies on top of the gravestones, and walk back up the hill, get to the trail, when we hear footsteps and laugh at each other and say to stop walking. We do so when we hear the crunch of footsteps, headlamps flinging around and we don't see anyone. Complete panic sets in, and we run up towards the road, and we stop after about a minute and hear nothing. Heavy breathing, holy craps all around us, and then we hear a full-on sprint behind us. I don't know what the hell it was, but there was 100% something running through the woods at us, and we hauled us out of there and back to one of the guy's car. Fort Campbell is definitely haunted by a dead soldier. Maybe the WLC platoon sausage, but definitely would not go back. One out of ten. Do not play with Private Casper. Fort Bliss 2018 out in the training way area, far east of El Paso. Well, me and my buddy are pulling guard duty in the 240 pit, which was really just a partially dug hole on top of a berm, and it's around 11.30 at night. I wanted to go back to bed, but wasn't super tired since I slept most of the day driving out there in our stikers. I'm mostly just bored and start looking up at the sky, which is clear with no moon, and I see one of those summertime storms off in the distance. Well, I see something and 
probably think it's a plane, but it's too fast moving and too far away for a plane. Plus, I can't see it without nods. So it must be the ISS satellite or something like that, right? When it makes a sharp turn at a 90 degree angle and continues on. At this point, I'm watching it pretty closely. It makes another right turn and starts moving backwards at this point, then another sharp right turn. What the hell is that, I wonder? I'm bringing it up with my buddy. I'm gonna admit it, we weren't really pulling guards anymore. At this point, we're probably just watching this thing up in the sky with like a fuzzy dot that's zigzagging in the sky for 15 minutes straight. We've never seen anything like it. Literally, when it shifted directions, it didn't turn or more like it bounced or got flung up. It just made these sharp 90 degree turns as if they were nothing. My buddy goes off to wake up the next guard shift and I'm still watching it. It goes bam and zooms off, leaving a light streak behind it. In about two seconds or less, it's now just above the horizon in front of me when it had been literally right above me the entire time and starts doing the same thing like it was zoning off gates and searching for something. My body accidentally scares the ever-loving crap out of me, hopping back into the pit, only to be followed by the noise of some Helios coming in, which got everyone on high alert. They were friendly and landed at the wrong landing zone. And once the whole friendly fiasco is over with the summer storm, the rain started. We never found out what the hell was in that sky. A year or two later, I brought it up with my dad and he said he witnessed pretty much the same thing back in Iraq in 2004. As far as I know, no aircraft can move that fast and still make rapid sharp turns. It wasn't a wide swooping turn or a gradual one. It was like when you chuck a bouncy ball against a wall. Sure, helicopters can turn like that, but this thing was moving way faster than any helicopter ever could and higher up, and it zoomed across the skyline like it was nothing. Does anyone have any explanation as to what the hell I saw that night? I used to work at Pendleton. My store was in a building from at least the 60s. Random things would fly off the shelves and the doors would open and close randomly. I had second shift, which ended at 11, I'd have to drive down a long, single lane road in the middle of nowhere to get to the base exit. There, sometimes you'd see people dressed in Vietnam era clothing or shadows for a split second and then they'd be gone. My co-workers have seen them too, so that's how I know that I am not crazy. I lived in an abandoned sail asylum on Camp Musketatuck, Indiana for a month while we were up for the NG. And of course, there were random holes in the wall that no one could see the end of, and no one really wanted to shine a light into it. Nothing happened to my knowledge, but I never went to do laundry alone. Now, there was this other time I was guarding SAHA at Camp Vilsec. I went with my buddy to walk the perimeter doing checks reach roughly the halfway point when we both feel a distinctly warm downdraft. We're both confused because we're outside. I double back but feel nothing. As I catch up to my body, we both feel it again, this time with enough force to move some dust around our feet. Again, nothing above us that we can see. So we both just nope it out of there and walk as fast as we can without running back to the shack at the gate. No one believed us when we told them. I've never experienced anything paranormal in the military. I'm an Air Force reservist that works on a Navy base in Norfolk. I joined a command as a war planner. Our building was a warehouse converted into office space. It was once a morgue during World War II, with ovens to house the mass casualties to industrial accidents like an explosion on a ship. Supposedly, it's haunted. People swear they've seen someone walking around when no one else is in the building. This building is highly secure with multiple HID access points to every door. I flew a KC-135 that is also supposedly haunted. It's on the Shadowlands website and has its own Facebook page. The story of tale number 585050 
which is a QT model jet originally modified to refuel the SR-71, is that in the 60s, a boom operator got sucked halfway through the celestial window that were used by the navigator to do star tracking for transoceanic navigation, a practice that is no longer in use due to GPS navigational systems. There are maintainers that refuse to be in the plane by themselves. Some claim to see the boom operator walk around in an old 60 Aeros flight suit and then vanish. Others will hear someone messing around with boom controls. The plane is based at Fairchild in Spokane. Or at least it was when I last flew it to Qatar. This is the first-hand account of a soldier who served the 110 CAV, or Buffalo Soldiers, and ended up being an instructor at Fort Huachuca, the home of the Buffalo Soldiers. They are part of the important American military history that is often overlooked, but definitely do not deserve to be so. This story happened at Weinstein Village Barracks. So, the guy in question decided to do some checks and go upstairs to where the MOST people live, down one hall, no issue. He heads back to go down to the other hall, and all the male MSOTs come out in shorts and flops, no shirts. He was going to the coke machine. No, dude, I know all the soldiers are in their rooms, but go put a shirt on. As he looks back down the hall, he swears he sees a man standing outside the window. He stared at him for five seconds. Then he just walked past it like normal walking, no climbing or anything. So he runs down the stairs, grabs the mag light from the desk and runs outside to the window. The window was on the third floor. There's not a ledge or anything and no way anyone without climbing equipment could get there, much less walk on it. He shines his light around to look for a rope or something because there was an issue at that point with soldiers rappelling on the windows, but there's nothing, no ropes. The instructor gets back inside and is shaken. The MOST from earlier had gotten his coke and was heading upstairs. When he went back to the desk, he asked if it was him shining the flashlight. Yes, he replies. So then he asks, without saying why, did you see the ghost? The only time in the army that our protagonist, the instructor, got spooked was when he brought it up with the SFC from BN who takes over SD each day about someone outside on the third floor window and he just shrugs. Oh, you saw the ghost? It should be noted that it was only 10 o'clock. No one was sleep deprived and there was only one roof access, the key for which was in his desk. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's military stories. We're back. It's been a fun month of compilations in January. Just some light listening material with some rain sound effects to help keep you going. I'm sorry that there was no video this Saturday or Sunday. I have been working on a super big project, which I'm very excited to launch soon. I was thinking of launching it today, but... I decided to start pumping out regular content. I think it will probably be live on Saturday, on the weekend or Sunday, if I can't get it up and running. It's, uh, it's going to be good. You're going to like it. And I really hope to see you there on the weekend. So keep an eye out on those notifications. Be sure to press the bell so that you are informed. I'd also like to give a huge thank you, as always, to my members and my patrons who support me ever so much. I'm so grateful for everything you guys do. Thank you. Let's wrap things up here though, guys. See you on Thursday for another video. Who knows, maybe you'll even get to vote on what it will be. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.